by moving your finger to and from the bead was a good, um, a good cue to my brain as to how to move my eyes. And I remember saying to her, to the um, vision therapist, I feel my eyes move. I feel them converging to see the closed feet and diverging to see the third one. And I can't tell you how exciting that was. I never had that experience before. And after that session, I went out to my car, sat down in the driver's seat, looked at the steering wheel, and it was floating in front of the dashboard. And there was this palpable pocket of space between the steering wheel and the dashboard. I was confused <laughs> because I, this was the day after my 48th birthday and I knew that stereo vision could only develop within the first years of life and I was more than 40 years past that point and I thought the sun was setting, it was an odd angle coming into the car, the odd angle of light. I must be just having some sort of uh, interesting illusion. And I just told myself to forget about it and drive home. And the next morning, I got up and I did the Brock string and other exercises before going to work. And I sat down in the car and I went to, re to adjust the rear view mirror and it was floating in front of the illusion. And all that day, my stereo vision began to emerge, sort of intermittently, taking me by total surprise. And it was totally delightful. Light fixtures were floating in midair. Sink faucets were thrusted out toward me. And I remember thinking, I've never seen an arc as beautiful as the arc of that sink faucet. <laughs> Trees were completely transformed. I could see the layers and layers and layers of depth in amongst the tree branches and roots. These pockets of space. And I would actually be walking home and immerse myself in the pocket of space that I could now see. Previously, I knew one leaf was in front of another because the, the leaf in front blocked the leaf behind. But everything was compressed. I didn't have that sense of those volumes of space between things. I had a sense of being immersed in a three-dimensional world because and, 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 you know, the description that I gave to Oliver Sacks that he wrote about Stereo C was a snowfall. That's how I ended my first letter to him, was that first time I, I saw snow in 3D. I was rushing out of um, my building to go grab some food at the deli for lunch. And I was moving fast because I, I was late. And all of a sudden I stopped. The snow was falling in these big, thick flakes. It was a late winter um, snowfall. And um, I guess you guys from Phoenix wouldn't relate to this, but um, it was a late winter snowfall and I could see each flake in its own space. And all the flakes together were producing this three-dimensional dance and I had this powerful sense of being immersed in this three-dimensional world, which I had never had before. In the past, the snow would fall in one plane slightly in front of me. And here it was falling all around me. And I completely forgot about lunch. I just stood there in the middle of campus watching the snow. You know, and I wondered about that. Why is it that stereopsis would have given me this? Because stereopsis, a lot of people say, well, it only works for things right in the fixation plane. You get a better sense of depth right in the fixation plane, right where you're looking. That's not true. Because what happens is you have something called qualitative stereopsis as well. And an image that's located in front or behind the fixation plane even if it's beyond panobsfusional area, it can't be fused into one image. Even those images, your brain takes account of the fact that they're falling on disparate parts of the two retinas, non-corresponding points, and says, aha, there's one, one object there, and it's located in front of or behind the fixation plane. And so you get a sense of that nearerness or furtherness of objects when you can integrate the input from the two eyes when you point the two eyes at some point in space at the same, some place in space at the same time. And so that whole sense of nearness or furtherness of objects, that space has <coughs> layers and layers of depth, that space has volume and that things occupy that space and that things have volume and that no two things can be in the same place at the same time. All of these things I knew, but I had never experienced 
perceptually. And now I was perceiving. And so that so many people, I just saw a letter to an editor of the Hartford Current when they aired my story and an ophthalmologist said, well, you know, stereopsis isn't all that important. It disappears after eight feet. Well, that was baloney. Anyway, large objects are still seen in stereo beyond eight feet. And it seemed to me I was watching those stereo movies a little bit beyond eight feet yesterday. But anyway, um, he completely misses this other property of binocular vision of this qualitative stereopsis, this sense of the layers and layers of depth. And part of the reason that he misses it, of course, is he's always had stereo vision. And if you've always had it, you can't just close one eye and know what it was like to see as I did. Or because your brain will fill in all the stereo information. Right. 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 I was going to say, can, can he see the stereo? If he's an ophthalmologist and operating on people's eyes, I sure hope he does. <laughs> It was an incredible revelation to me how much I had been missing. And I have to say this, my husband's an astronaut. He's flown in space three times. This is an image, this is a picture of when the shuttle blasted off, this was in January of 1996, on his first mission, and that was at two in the, four in the morning, it was a night launch, it was absolutely spectacular. All his launches were spectacular. And I gotta say this, it was fantastic watching him blast off into space, but it pales in comparison to seeing him staring. <laughs> <laughs>